everyone. Uh, this, is, this is a picture from the northwest corner of China. It's the Gobi Desert, and it's where the Gobi Desert meets the Tian Shan mountain range. So I was there to run an ultra marathon. It was a seven day, 250 kilometer self-supported race. So we're carrying our food for the seven days, um, our medical equipment, clothing. This picture was taken on the fifth day. So for the first four days, we ran a marathon. The fifth day I call the crucible. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm in the desert, alone, exhausted. I have nothing but my headlamp. And I, I'm scanning in front of me for the pink flags to, that mark the trail, and I see this. And I'd like to say that I was brave. And I'd like to say that I didn't pee myself a little. <laughs> But that would be a lie. And all of it is true. It, it, when, you, when you're faced with imminent death, you really do think of your family. And that's where my mind went. So can you guess which one I am? <laughs> I, I think they're all cute. <laughs> so that's me. And so that is, that is the last time I will rock bangs and a white pantsuit. <laughs> I have never achieved that fashion look since. So this is a picture of my family. Um, we were born in Vietnam, all of us. And we were, as the intro said, part of the boat people. And it was, I was born December 74. And five months later was the fall of Saigon. So the, the war ended shortly after I was born. My parents made the decision to leave. This is a picture of us at the refugee camp. And this picture is so dear to me because it's one of the few things that we have from that time. And um, the story that my parents continually shared with us, the story of risking everything and embarking on a harrowing journey and going into the great unknown, but with a, ho with a, strong, with a hope that's stronger than fear. So, my family was sponsored to a little town called Brooks. Uh, we arrived in Brooks January of 1980. And as you can imagine, the weather at that time, it was quite shocking. <laughs> but this is where I grew up. And this is, where, this is where there's a huge paradox in the narrative of my family and my narrative. Because although that, that refugee photo is, is really dear to me, I actually don't have memories of that time. And the narrative that I'm told is my parents' narrative. So I grew up in this, in this calmness, in this place of safety and comfort. But the safety didn't feel comfortable, because there was something in my soul that was yearning for something harder, yearning for a struggle. So I picked the thing that I hated most. <laughs> Does anyone remember the 12-minute run in high school? <laughs> I, cu I couldn't do the 12-minute run. I hated it. So, so when I was searching my soul for, like, what, what challenge do I want to take on? I'm going to become a runner. And, and because of my wanderlust, I thought, OK, I'm, I'm going to run like around the world. What do these four people have in common? They're all, they're all marathon runners. And they're all faster than me. <laughs> Do you know who this is? You might know her from the next slide. So the reason why I put up this picture is because Pamela Anderson and I have the same marathon finishing time. <laughs> So, but, but think about what that means. Essentially, I run as fast as someone whose entire career was spent running slow motion in sand. <laughs> <laughs> so
so back to my, back to my fancy dreams of running and running around the world. I truly believe that the universe conspires to help the dreamer. I believe that if you authentically ask the universe what's your, your soul's desires, it will send things into your life to help you get there. So, I found a writing contest online. It was put on by CBC, and it was a nationwide writing contest. They wanted you to submit an essay about where you wanted to go and why. So I wrote about, um, I thought it'd be neat, neat to do <laughs> the Antarctic Marathon, because I thought travel, running, what a great idea. <laughs> and, and so I won. I won the contest, and they sponsored me to go run this race in Antarctica. And the feeling of elation of winning the contest was short-lived because, <laughs> because of the sinking feeling of that I would have to run a marathon <laughs> in Antarctica. <laughs> so, and it was around that time too that, I don't know if you remember, Mark's work warehouse used to look like this. And then it rebranded and it looked like this. But in that process, they were having a contest. <laughs> And it was through Virgin Radio and Mark's Rick Warehouse, and they were trying to find Calgary's most remarkable person. And they were going to choose seven people and fund them to help pursue their dreams. I asked my brother if he would nominate me. And he said, I'm a terrible writer. And I said, it's okay. I'll write the nomination <laughs> in your voice as long as you email it in. He's like, no problem. <laughs> So I won. <laughs> and the radio guy actually said, your brother is, he loves you. <laughs> he, he said the nicest things about you. So this is Antarctica. So that was in December of 2011. I finished miraculously. So but remember, I couldn't do the 12 minute run. And when the results came out, I was a top 10 finisher. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. But only because there were only nine women. <laughs> so if you look at the times, you'll realize that Yvonne Brown crossed the finish line. She probably went back to her tent. And if she had a copy of the Titanic, she could have watched it, <laughs> finished the whole movie, and then I would have crossed the line three hours later. But no matter, I was a top 10 finisher. <laughs> so I ran at the bottom. Logically, what do you do after that? Right? So then I decided I wanted to run at the North Pole. <laughs> In my dream, the angel shrugged and said, if we fail this time, it will be a failure of imagination. And then she placed the world gently in the palm of my hand. So when I came back, I'm a teacher, and although we make a great living, it's, we can't afford to do these really costly runs. The, re the registration fees are exorbitant. But I had this idea that I would win a contest. <laughs> and I remember saying to my friends, I was like, well, what are you going to do next? And I said, I'm th I think I'm going to win a contest, <laughs> and then I'm going to go run at the North Pole. And they're like, all right. <laughs> and nine months later, I won a contest <laughs> that brought me to the North Pole. I love this shot because the race official has a, sh a gun a <laughs> to protect us from polar bears. So when I crossed the line, I had this thought that, I, I'm, official, I'm Canada's official bipolar runner. <laughs> and I, I mean no disrespect to mental illness, but... So, lucky me, there were only five women. <laughs> so then I was top five, and... So <laughs> And suddenly, my resume went from she can't finish 12-minute run 
to a top 10 finisher in two really difficult races. So, and that's when Husqvarna stepped up. So Husqvarna had a? Good. <laughs> and they wanted us to write about how, what we, what, how we challenge the impossible. So I wrote about how I had done these races, and I won. <laughs> and, then, and then they published my story. And so with that money, I was able to sue, pursue my next goal, which was the four deserts. And it's, like I said, the seven-day, 250-kilometer self-supported races in four hot deserts of the world. If you complete those, you go back. Well, I was going to go back to Antarctica to the last desert. If, you, if you're going through hell, keep going. So before I left for, for these races, I was reading all the literature I could find. And all the literature will tell you the same thing. It's brutal. Don't do it. People have died. People have been hospitalized. And I just thought, I'm not going to take someone's opinion as my own experience. I wanted to unfold my own myth, and I wanted to live this experience. And, and would you believe me if I said that it wasn't hell? It was actually stunning, and that every day that I was out there was magical. Stunning scenery and sunshine and fresh air and exercise with like-minded people. A really supportive medical team. <laughs> and most importantly, after a long day, every night I got to go to bed with these men. <laughs> Sign me up, right? <laughs> and now to this company near and dear my heart. So Husqvarna had helped me with a bit of the four deserts. And then duct tape stepped up, and they had a contest, and it was a writing contest, and it was, the question was, how did duct tape save the day? So I had a story about how I used it to tape my goggles in Antarctica so that I wouldn't get snow blind. And they liked it so much that they asked me if I had anything else planned for the year, and I told them about the four deserts. <laughs> and they said, write up a proposal. So in my proposal, um, I outlined the costs and everything, and, and then at, at, at the bottom of it, I put, you know, I'm, I'm just an, an ordinary runner, but I promise you, like duct tape, I will always stick to it. <laughs> <laughs> I will never give up. And they liked it, so they, they backed me to do these races. And in exchange, I had to do articles about how duct tape was used in the desert. And the story practically wrote itself because it, it is the, one of the most useful things that you can have in your backpack. <laughs> so this is the third desert race. It was in northern Chile, um, in Atacama. This was 55 kilometers into an 80-kilometer day. And one of, the, one of the things that plays through my mind when I'm going through things like this is enjoy the moment, because one day you will feel nostalgic for this moment. And so whatever pain you're going through, I trust you if you're birthing a baby, if you're going through something really challenging. We love the past. Our minds live there. And we glorify it. But I knew that one day I would be nostalgic for this moment, and that those are the ideas that pushed me along. So I finished the three hot deserts. I was invited to Antarctica to do the last desert. Uh, people asked me about the weather. I said it's kind of like a springtime in Calgary. <laughs> Okay, okay, wait, but that awkward moment when you're dressed like somebody else at the party? <laughs> and this picture, because like any vain female, I want to protect my face. The hands I can lose to frostbite, but not the face, right? <laughs> and so with this, I became the first Canadian woman to complete the Four Desert series. And because I did it in one calendar year, it was considered a grand slam. 
making me the eighth woman in history to do so. But again, so the universe conspires to help the dreamer. And as an average runner, there's no way I could get the regular support uh, that other ultra athletes get. So I got the support of these companies. And this, this is not, <laughs> these are not companies traditionally associated with running. It's more like, because <laughs> like, maybe if I was a lumberjack or something. <laughs> so you're probably wondering what happened. Alone in the Gobi, in the pitch darkness, I saw dozens of eyes gleaming back at me. And I remember thinking, if I just grip my hiking poles tight, maybe I can take some of them out <laughs> before they kill me. Or if I, if, maybe if I turn off my headlamp and make myself invisible, I can sneak quietly by. Or maybe if I hold my breath and just Stand here in stillness, they won't detect me. And then suddenly, in the darkness, in the silence, I heard, bah. <laughs> so really, all that peeing for nothing. <laughs> So this is a picture I took. It was um, in the in the in Wadi Rum in Jordan, and going back to the narrative of my parents of of evolving, of risking everything, of embarking on a harrowing journey, of having that hope that's stronger than fear. I think that's what evolving is. It's passing through those crucibles and, and having the experience forge you into something that's stronger and better. Thank you. <laughs>